What the Actual Fork podcast is co-hosted by two intuitive eating registered dietitians, yours truly, Sammy Previtt, owner of Fine Food Freedom, and Jenna Warner, owner of Happy Strong Healthy. We can't stand diet culture bullshit and love keeping it real. Our mission is for all humans to believe that they are made for so much more than chasing a smaller body. We are also here to share with you that food can be fun and pleasurable again. Although we are medical professionals, we are human too. We are not afraid to share our deepest, darkest secrets and how years of our lives were taken by diet culture. We started this podcast so no human has to feel alone in their journey towards food freedom. So get comfy and join us for a casual convo where you can expect to laugh, cry, learn, and grow. Welcome back to another episode of What the Actual Fork podcast. I'm freaking excited you're here because this is an interview I've been wanting to do for a really, really long time. This woman has just been absolutely crushing it on her corner of the internet. And I'm just so freaking excited for you to hear today's interview with Tiffany Ema. And Tiffany on Instagram, if you look at her bio, she kind of coins herself as simple body confidence, eating disorder recovery, and teaching you to ditch body shame and feel at home in the body that you have now. Tiffany and I touched on so many different things today, but I think my favorite thing about her was how vulnerable she is and how she is so willing to just share and be open in order to help others. She has not always been this body confident person. So in today's interview, we really go through her journey of how she got here. So she talks about her eating disorder struggles. She talks about how being a black woman in society and how that contributed to different body image issues. We talked about just body image issues in general and how they do not discriminate against all shapes, sizes, colors, genders, sexualities, etc. We, she really gave us some tips that we can walk away with from this episode. So not just her own personal journey, of course, that's really important and that's a huge part of it, but then saying, okay, here's my personal journey. Here's how I got to where I am today, but here are some tips and here are my biggest tips that I would give to people that want to feel at home in their body and want to feel body confident. So definitely, definitely want to get some pen and paper out today and write those down or pull out your phone because she really, really shares a ton with us. In addition to that, we talk a lot about movement in this episode. Um, We discuss just how those in marginalized bodies are oppressed and how that fits into diet, all things diet culture um, and just making peace with your own body. So this episode, I'm just so grateful for it. I'm so thankful for it. I think it is going to be so helpful to any human being that listens and that resides in a body. I always say when you, when you listen to our podcast, We are for you if you eat food and have a body. So today's episode, if you have ever had a negative body image thought, if you have ever compared yourself to somebody else, if you just are having a bad body image day, this episode is absolutely for you. Go follow Tiffany Ema, I-M-A, is how you spell Ema, on Instagram and just really enjoy this conversation and get curious of what comes up for you. No judgment, no shame, no guilt. Just get curious of what comes up for you and enjoy this episode with Tiffany Ema. Welcome back to another episode of What the Actual Fork podcast. Today we have the wonderful Tiffany. And Tiffany, I forgot to ask you how to say your last name before we get started. Is it Ima or Ema? It's Ema. <laughs> Ema. All right. Perfect. Tiffany Ema. Um, I've always wondered that. So I'm so glad I got that answer today. <laughs> um, I'm sure our listeners are already following you, but if you do not go follow her immediately on Instagram at Tiffany Ema, that's I-M-A. Tiffany, thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to chat today. <laughs> yes. This has been a long time coming. I feel like I've been badgering you in your DMs for months now. Um, <laughs> so I'm excited to talk all things body confidence with you. But before we do that, 
we always love to ask this question just to kind of open up and really set the scene of how much diet culture sucks. So our podcast, we got the name What the Actual Fork because we just felt like every day, every moment, every hour, we just see shit online that's like, what the actual fuck? But then we just implemented the word fork instead. So I always love to ask, like, what's something that stands out to you, whether it was in the last day, week, month, like what has been a what the actual fork moment for you? where you saw something and you're like, are you serious? Like, what is this? You know, I have a lot of those moments and I think every single day there's something that pops up that I'm just like, what in a world? But um, so I'm going to generalize it. And I will say that I have those moments every time I see like a major contradiction with diet culture. Um, one of the big ones is I, I did a reel about this last week is when people are like, are trying to say that fat people are lazy and they need to go to the gym. And then they're like mad when brands make plus size clothing. Um, one, of that, one of those, that's like the biggest contradiction ever. It's like, that's when you know that they don't actually care about health and they just care about size and, you know, making people fit into this standard. I'm air quoting standard because it, it has changed so many times. <laughs> who, who can really keep up? Exactly. <laughs> Exactly. I love that. And I think it's, I love asking that question because like you said, there's so many, like mm -hmm. the entire world is one big, what the actual fork moment <laughs> over and over. So it's always interesting to hear just what's been the most recent one in your world. So thank you for sharing that with us. And so I would just love to hear from you. Like, I feel like I know a lot from being such a big follower of yours, but I, you know, I would love for you to tell our listeners, like, how did you get to where you are today? Like, were you always doing this body confidence work? Like, how have you ended up where you're at right now? And you can take 30 seconds or 30 minutes to share your story, whatever you <laughs> want to share. I don't even think I could do it in 30 seconds. And I definitely don't want to do it in 30 minutes. We'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll try to meet somewhere in the middle of that. <laughs> um, so I definitely have not always been on this body confidence journey. I was always more on the side of diet culture um, and being wrapped up in diet culture and believing that the way for me to earn value in this world is to change my body. And a lot of it stems from one, you know, being in a society that has this image that you should be. And then also from being a black woman who looked absolutely nothing like that, that um, image. And so for me, it seemed like the only part of that I could control is becoming skinny. And that kind of set me down this path of trying to be as skinny as possible. And you know, when you have, when you fall into an eating disorder, it usually is encouraged by people as you like get smaller and smaller. And I want to clarify that I've never been I've never been um, plus size. I've always been on the smaller side, but like my goal was to be like a double zero with a 24 inch waist. Um, and I would always say like, just I'm on my way to double zero, which I did get there at some point. Um, but it was, it was just, you know, through over exercising and under eating. Um, and so when I was in college, I went through bulimia. Uh, it was the first eating disorder that I had. I've had um, a few, and but that was the first diagnosable one that I had. I remember the moment that I started to think about my body as too large. Um, when I was in high school, I ran track, I played basketball, volleyball, all of that. And I never really thought about the size of my body because, you know, I was blessed to have a mom who didn't make me diet or tell me that I need to be skinnier. In fact, she always told me I was too small. She always had me eating more. But when I got to college and and I wasn't playing um, sports and, you know, I was eating on campus, just like everyone, they call it the freshman 15. And um, I remember I was in my dorm. One of my dorm mates was looking at my pictures. I was trying to show her something else that had nothing to do with my weight. Um, but she's like, oh, yeah, look at you. You gained so much weight now. Like your face is a lot bigger. And that was like the moment that kind of set me down that path. And it was the first time someone like made me feel like I was too large and you know at that time I I wasn't I was like a size six I, I'm probably the same size I am now um 
but it made me really think that I needed to lose weight. And so I started getting back into exercise, but with this one goal of losing weight and um, I started, I would go to the gym. My eating disorder started as exercise bulimia where I would eat and then I would go to the gym for hours. I mean, if I wasn't in class or doing homework, I was at the gym and I would be there like on, um, on either the treadmill or the elliptical for just hours, just trying to work off as many calories as I can. And I started to calorie count and look at labels and become like obsessed with uh, food labels and learning what, how many calories I was putting in my body. And then I restricted myself to 1200 calories. And then of course I would binge because that's just not enough food, especially you're walking around campus all day. And so that was something that um, went on for close to a decade. Um, it just got worse and worse over time. And at some point in 2014, 15-ish, I was like, I like, I can't live like this. Like this is, this is wild. Like I can't live my life like this. Um, and you know, it was dealing with an eating disorder and also dealing with being in the world, pretending that I was super confident and, um, I started out online in 2011. I was a style blogger when I first got online. And the added pressure of being a style blogger and feeling like I need to keep up with the Joneses. And like, every time I would shop, it would be like, oh, my followers like this outfit. Will they react to this? How can I take a picture of this? And it was just so much. Um, and I got to a breaking point where I was just like, this, is, this isn't this is what I want to be doing. I can't live like this. And that's when I really started to actually look for diagnosis um, and start to get treatment for like bipolar depression and, um, just figuring out like all these things are working together with my mental health. And it was the year that I decided that I wouldn't do this anymore. And I know that's like an oversimplification. Um, but I always felt like that was a decision that I had to make. I can't do this. Um, and so from there, I started to learn how to use fitness for health and to manage my depression and to um, use fitness more for my mental health versus for, um, you know, controlling what my body looked like. And I kind of let go of all these preconceived notions about what my body would look like, you know, still being aware that exercise could change my body, um, but not like trying to lose weight um, or be as skinny as possible, but it was more about getting strong and um, building mental strength and, and just being as uh, fit as I could mentally and physically. And that was where I started down this path of the body confidence. And at that point, I still had a lot to learn. I, I think I, you know, I was still wrapped in diet culture somewhat. Um, and I really felt like that, uh, I, even though I wasn't trying to lose weight, I knew that working out would keep my body smaller and like working out as much as I was working out. Um, so it was like, kind of like my journey when I was like, you know, kind of in the middle, um, still had more recovery to go, um, and still had more learning about diet culture. And it really was over the last two years where I really learned about diet culture and it really clicked. And I think the pandemic really made it click because it was the first time in my life that I was not active at all. And I was just at home and I knew that I was you know, I was falling into depression again because I was not around people. I was just by myself all the time. And it was like, I had learned everything I needed to learn up until 2020. And then it didn't click until 2020 started to go along. And that's where I really started to like dive in and, and understand that diet culture is something that can grip your mind and control the way that you eat, the way that you live, your social activities and all of that. And so, you know, 2020 was the year I, I let myself um, really eat intuitively and I allowed myself to gain weight and I allowed myself to experience what it was like to be intuitive. Um, and it was eye-opening because all the knowledge that I had been packing into my brain the last three years started to really fall into place and really lock in for me. Um, and, you know, it was that was really my journey to becoming confident in my body in the sense that it doesn't, I don't have to love the way that my body looks in order to 
respect and have love for my body. And that was when it really clicked for me. And I, you know, I prefer to not be neutral about my body. Um, as a black woman, I have been told my whole life that my body is wrong. Um, and I hated my body for so long that at this point, like neutrality is something that I use as a tool when I'm having like bad body, body image days. And I use it as a, a stepping ground, a stopping place. But for me, like, I don't want to be neutral about my body because I feel like um, just being joyful in who I am and in my body is a form of activism. And, um, and I choose to be confident in my body and to love my body. And, you know, there are things that I don't love and that's okay. It doesn't matter. It doesn't change my worth. So that's kind of how I got to where I am today. I really just started wanting to share that with people so that I can help other people. Um, I really truly believe I have a gift to, to, to give a message in a clear way that really helps people. And I knew that like I couldn't keep all of that inside of me. So that's how I got to where I am on Instagram with sharing everything. Oh, I need to take a deep breath. That was amazing. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing every single piece of that story. And I was like scribbling notes the whole time as you were talking, just little things that were sticking out to me. But it's, I think so many people can relate to that in so many ways of, I wrote down the words diet rock bottom. You talked about that point where you're just like, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. I can't live my life this way. I can't let diet culture take anything else from me. And I think so many people get to that point, but don't know what to do with it. Right. And I think it's, I think it's beautiful. It's so cool to hear for you how the pandemic was like this, like almost like exper experiment for you where you had all the knowledge, you had done so much of the work. And then, and then it was like, all right, Tiffany, like it's go time. Like mm -hmm. let's do it. And, um, that, that is so cool to hear how that's impacted you. And, and I would love to hear, you talked a lot about fitness and how kind of like what your relationship was and what your intention with fitness was when we were mm -hmm. in diet culture versus now the intention behind movement for you is so different. Can you shed any light on how, how you got there? Because I know so many times people say like, logically, I know I should move for, you know, joyful movement or because it's good for me or because it feels good. Mm -hmm. But of course, if it were as easy as logic, like everybody would do that. So exactly. anything you want to shed on how that intention shifted for you? It feels like it was just a switch in my mind when I was just like, I don't have room anymore within myself to force my body to do anything. And I knew that when I started to use fitness for my mental health, and that was my main goal was to help to alleviate symptoms of depression. And I just knew that I didn't have room to force my body to do anything anymore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though, like I said earlier, at the beginning of that journey, I still had some diet culture um, inside of me and I still, you know, wanted to be on the smaller side. Um, but that was the beginning of that moment. I knew I didn't have room to force my body to do anything. I just kind of let it do what it, what it did as I learned how to exercise and learn how to lift weights. And, um, I think with the pandemic, having, having all that time by myself in my house without access to a gym and without access to movement, without access to people before I was, um, before lockdown, I was a server and a bartender. So, I mean, I was always like, in addition to lifting three to five times a week, I was also on my feet for work. So I just never really experienced that weight gain aspect of recovery that I think is important for recovery when you're, when you have an eating disorder. Um, so even though I was, you know, recovering, I just, I never really slowed down to let all of that sink in until the pandemic. And I think that really solidified it for me. It was that, that moment where I was like, exercise, being able to move my body is a privilege and it's something that I should be thankful for and, and should be joyful. There are many people who can't move like that. Um, and experiencing just as, you know, one small iota of that feeling of just being locked in the house. And I hate home workouts unless I can figure out a way to make it fun. Um, so for me, like 
if I wasn't able to get up and go to the gym, I really wasn't moving very much. I'm very extroverted and I get energy by having people around me. Um, so it was the one time in my life that I really experienced what it felt like to not be able to move in the way that I wanted to. Um, and to see my body change over that year and as I gained weight and allowed myself to gain weight without judging it, without feeling any type of way about it, and just letting that be a neutral thing, um, it really locked in what intuitive eating meant for me, as well as what it meant to pursue joyful movement. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Do you feel like there was any part, just out of curiosity, was there any part of you that, like, after that year of being locked inside, that you found that your body started to like crave movement again, but not because again, not because that intention was like, okay, you have to go work out and change your body. But because it was like, I get to move my body. Like did that, do you think that intentional rest period was not only important for, like you said, the weight gain portion, but of helping restore your relationship with movement? Oh yeah. It was, it was very much, I get to go to the gym. I get to deadlift. I love deadlifting. I get to um, teach me how to love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it also taught me that it doesn't have to be, I don't have to have a strict schedule of exercise. Mm -hmm. Like I don't have to, you know, have this planned out gym workout where I do that. Like if I have a week where I'm like, I don't really want to lift weights. I have my jump rope. I have my virtual reality movement. I have yoga. I have all these things that I really like to do and not feeling bound to one thing um, because movement, it really is something that is beneficial. Um, but the way that diet culture teaches it is that you have to do one thing and you have to do it this many times a week and you have to do it for this many time, many hours a day. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like this really strict thing where like, if you choose to be a runner, then you run every day. If you choose to be a lifter, then you lift every day and there's no variation. And in lifting, it's like, I hate cardio, cardio messes with my gains. And like, there's all these things that kind of make you feel restricted in the way that you move. And I just don't allow that to be a thing anymore. I'm like, I love lifting. That's like my primary form of movement. But there really are times where I'm just like, I'm not like, I just don't want to do that. And, yeah. you know, my movement might be a walk that day or I might bike. There's so many different things I love to do that it it makes it feel more free and more joyful because I can choose versus like restricting myself to one type of thing to, you know, to form my body in a specific way. It makes so much sense. And I love that, that freedom of choice and you get to figure out like, what do I actually enjoy doing versus mm -hmm. like you said, back in the day, it was like treadmill, elliptical hours, calorie burning, like that's it. And it's yeah. like, no, there's so many amazing forms of movement. So I feel like we have to drag, not drag, we have to connect this into your tagline of, you know, on Instagram, on your website, teaching you to ditch body shame and feel at home in the body that you have now. I love that. I love talking about embodiment with people. So if you had to pick, it's totally up to you. One tip, two tip, three tips, tops, like your favorite little nuggets, golden nuggets of information when you're chatting with someone and trying to help them feel confident in their body or at home in their body, what comes up for you? Yeah, absolutely. The first thing is just mindset. You have to really work on disconnecting the way that you body, your body looks from how you see your value. And that is such a huge portion of it because once you can separate that aspect of it and know that your worth and your value is not predicated on what your body looks like, then you can really start to do that the work to um, to instill that mindset in you day after day, because it really is something that you have to keep doing, especially when you first start on a journey, because we've been taught so long that our beauty is our value and the way that we look is our value. And so it really takes a lot of a learning to, um, to undo all of that and understand that your value is way more than way you, the way you look and like the way you look is like I barely on the list but if it is it's like the last thing because we as people we just have so many unique qualities and so many things that make us who we are as people and those are the things that you should focus on so that's my number one tip 
understanding that your body, your appearance, appearance is not your value. And then I would say number two is to start to look at your weight as a neutral thing. I think one of the things people get confused about when we talk about anti-diet lifestyle is that, you know, diet culture is like, well, you hate, you hate weight loss and you think everyone should just gain weight and be fat. And people say this specifically, but for me, it's more like weight is a neutral thing. Sometimes I lose weight. Sometimes I gain weight and whatever, you know, my body is changing and that's fine. Um, and, and really just understand that your weight in and of itself is neutral because weight loss and weight gain, both of those things can be neutral, right? Um, and, you know, also knowing that everyone has a, a range of weight that is like their set point range. And it varies from people to people. Some people's set point range is only like five pounds. And some people's set point range is, is large, like five to, to 25 pounds. And mine is, that's what mine is. I lose and gain weight very easily. Any change in my body, any change in the way that I eat, any change in my exercise, my body will change um, over a period of time. And um, not everyone's body is like that. Some people have a hard time gaining weight. Some people have a hard time losing weight. And some people can do both very easily. And, you know, understanding that that's totally fine and it's totally neutral to have all those things because by body diversity is a beautiful thing. And the last thing that I would say is that you have to start to understand that comparison is not going to do you any favors. Looking at the next person um, and seeing what their body looks like is not going to help you out. Because like I was just saying, all of our bodies are very different. We could eat the same, we could work out the same, have the exact same regimen, even sleep the exact same way. And our bodies could still look very, very different. And just understanding that because I think when we are trying to shape our bodies into a specific form we have a specific form in mind we're like oh I want you know that waist that's like that and my butt that's like that and you kind of in your mind build this picture up and a lot of times that picture does not work with our genetics and our genetics are going to dictate what our bodies look like we just have to let that happen because it is what it is um and just understanding that it is what it is. <laughs> um, but, you know, for me, I really, like, I've come to this place where I'm just like, this is just how my body is. For instance, I got into this place, this hor this is a horrible habit, by the way, and I'm not encouraging this, but I got into a habit of ordering from DoorDash every single day. And I think I needed it for a while because I just was like, I'm not cooking a thing. Mm -hmm. And... But I got also out to this place where I'm looking at my bank account like, bitch, you spent how much <laughs> on DoorDash? And I'm like, and also like not getting enough fresh foods and things like that. And so, you know, I made a switch and immediately I saw a body, my body change after a week of not eating DoorDash every day. And that's, to me, that's neutral. That's just like, okay, you know, stop stopping ordering DoorDash every day is a healthy thing for many reasons. It's healthy for my wallet. It's healthy for my body. It's healthy for my mind. And it makes me like get up and actually have to do something. And, um, you know, when you think about changes like that, making healthy changes, making lifestyle changes, you have to think about it from this place of it being a sustainable thing and a thing that makes sense. Not ordering DoorDash every day, that makes sense. <laughs> And, and so, like, when you think about those things, you see them from this place that's just like, oh, this is this is just a thing. Like, this is just a neutral thing that's happening right now versus, mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm a terrible person for eating DoorDash. I eat out way too much. Oh, I'm eating so bad versus, versus thinking of it that way. You're just like, all right, this is just what happened for a little while. Now mm -hmm. I'm making a change. And it's totally fine to do that. Yes. I love that. Just looking at our behaviors from, again, a, a place of neutrality. There's no morality tied to them. And knowing that like, hey, our weight is not a behavior. So we can, if we want to improve our health, we can look at all these different behaviors from a place of neutrality and say, are these making me feel physically, mentally, emotionally pleasant? And it sounds like when you looked at your bank account, that was not emotionally pleasant for you. It wasn't, you know? it really wasn't. <laughs> right? And you didn't have to judge yourself for it, but it was just, it's, if we can, I think this comes back to too with intuitive eating and anti-diet of just like 
self-compassion and like speaking to mm-hmm. ourselves, like we would speak to a friend, like if a friend came to you and told you she spent that much money on DoorDash, like it's not you to be like, ew, like you're a terrible person, right? Right. Like, you're like, oh, <laughs> maybe you don't want to do that, you know? Um, so I love, I love those three tips. And I also just want to, you know, call to, you've mentioned a couple of times throughout this episode, just how being a black woman in this society mm-hmm. and how growing up, like all you saw was a certain type of person. Mm -hmm. And it made you compare and you kind of brought up that comparison trap. And I just, I want to just say like, thank you so much for being who you are, for sharing that, for being in this space. Jenna and I talk a lot on our episodes, how, you know, we are dietitians, but I honestly hate even using that word because I think Mm -hmm. there's so much like terrible food police stigma to it. Um, But the majority of dietitians are thin white women and, just having that on Instagram or wherever and, and people seeing a thin white woman constantly saying, be confident in your body. Mm-hmm. What kind of message does that send? And so um, I'm a huge fan of Sabrina Strings and her work with fearing mm-hmm. the black body and the racial roots of fat pho- phobia. So I would love to just hand it over to you if there's anything you want to add to that. But really, I just wanted to address it and say, like, thank you for bringing it up. Thank you for sharing it because that's a huge part of diet culture that I think people are often afraid to tap into mm-hmm. um, or they ignore completely. Right. And it's interesting because it's come up a lot. I made a post about it. Chrissy King made a post about it recently. Um, and then someone, I can't remember whose account it was, they made a post about it too. And that person was a thin white person. It was, it was interesting to see the different dynamic of the two accounts and the comments that came in from those. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that It's a hard thing because we don't want to say that thin white woman can't post about body image. That's not something that we want to say. Um, And that's not the message that we're intending to get across when we talk about the roots of the body positivity movement. What we're saying is that, hey, like body positivity was not initially meant to be a general self-love wave of people just loving their bodies. It was intended to be about liberation for those in marginalized bodies. And it's being ignored. That's what we're saying. Mm-hmm. And it's it's really hard because it's like Instagram, our accounts are very, very like, I want to say selfish. They're very much us. Like, my account is my account. Of course. I'm going to post what I want to post. But I do think there is a way to do it that is is beneficial for more people. Um, for instance, the post that I was mentioning earlier was about the side by sides of a thin white woman like pushing her stomach out. And then like the next one is them just, you know, standing regularly. And they really don't look very different at all. Um, and it was a post about that not being extremely helpful and you know that's true it's not that helpful for people uh, you know to the general body positivity movement um that is about liberation but it might help someone with body dysmorphia who may also be a thin white woman and it might help that person on a personal level so you know i really i really see those two things as separate like there's this personal body image work that everyone deserves to do. No one should, you know, should have to be involved in an eating disorder. Or no one should have to feel like shit about their body. And then there's this, you know, liberation aspect of marginalized bodies. And I think that, you know, a lot of people are not willing to take their platform and talk about that and say like, hey, I am thin, I'm a white woman. And, you know, I've struggled with eating disorders, but I also understand that, you know, there are people in marginalized body who are actually systematically dep- uh, oppressed mm-hmm. and it affects them not just on a personal level, but it's a whole system that affects the way that their life unfolds, like the way that they get jobs, the way that they receive medical care and all of those things. And I always think that anyone in a straight sized body, and that includes myself, and I talk about this a lot on my own platform, I think anyone in this niche who's in a straight sized body should talk about their thin privilege. And, you know, I always think, like, I am a dark-skinned Black woman living in America, and I can talk about a sense of privilege that I have with my body size. Um, And even though I'm not, like, super skinny right now, 
like my body is very capable of being very lean um and my body is very capable of you know fitting into clothing at every store i can go in the store and and buy clothes and people always think i'm a plus size or mid size i'm not and i talk about that because i don't want to be put on pages like follow this blogger she's plus size and i'm like i'm not like you need to give that to a person who is actually plus size um someone tagged me recently in a post it was they tagged me um Juju from Fit Fat and all that, Mick Zazon, and someone else who was actually fat. And they were like, you know, these are all these non straight size people to follow. And I'm like, three or four of us straight size, those spots need to go to people who actually are plus size. And I think that's where the distinction is important because what you see is the movement being taken over and people are taking spots of those who the marginalized body who should be put forward in these situations and it's like you know you see you if you if you go to that post and you're like oh here's some plus size people i can follow and then you like go and you start asking them and i get dms hey where where's a good place to buy plus size clothes like where's a good place that where do you shop to buy your clothes i'm like i can shop anywhere um i most of my clothes are from like made well and I know a lot of people can't shop there and I, I do my best to shop at places that have um have a variety of sizes and sizes that are actually diverse um but at the same time like I'm not a good person to come to about where to buy plus size clothing from and I think you know, it's a sense of false advertising because, you know, someone might follow me like, oh, this is a plus size blogger I can follow. And then they're like looking at my feet down the line and they're, they're like, wait, she's not plus size. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I um, I think that's why it's important to acknowledge and, and separate those things so that people who actually are in marginalized bodies in the sense that they are, you know, and they're in fat bodies, because, you know, I'm marginalized as a Black woman, um, mm -hmm. but, like, in a sense that they're in fat bodies, I think they deserve to have a spotlight, and they deserve to be able to see themselves and not be completely washed over by a wall of thin white woman. You look at the body positivity hashtag, and it's it's all thin white women. It's all mm -hmm. it is. It's all you see. Um, and I know a lot of uh, fat positive bloggers in the space have stepped back from body positivity. Most of them don't even use a term anymore um, because it's just like, it's so confusing because people think it, all it is is about self-love and that's not what it was originally intended for. So I know that was a very a long way around to that, um, but I think that's why it is important to call it out and talk about thin privilege and give space to people who are actually in plus size bodies and make sure that you are actually talking about the issues. Like, and I also understand that it's hard to talk about the issues when you don't really know about them or you don't experience them. You don't experience them, and you're not sometimes aware of them. I think that most people are aware, um, but have a hard time trying to fold that into what they already talk about. Um, but I do think there's a way to, you know, be a person that is thin and white and talk about. Um, their body. I actually I saw a post today. Um, it was it was um, own it, babe. She posted um, a really good post today, just about not uh, looking to your past body. And I thought it was just very well done. It was just about body image in general. It wasn't like, oh, you know, I'm I'm thin in this picture and I'm thin in this picture. And I think there's a a good way to talk about it that isn't disrupting the movement for marginalized bodies so I could talk about that all day <laughs> I love everything that you just said and thank you so much for sharing that I couldn't agree more I think there's ways that as you know professionals in this field we can talk about really hard conversations that some people are afraid to have but by and we don't have to center our body every single time and I loved how you use that difference of like the side, the side by side photos that have blown up of like air quotes skinny and then like air quotes rolls, but it's like right. one roll and it's like <laughs> you're totally missing the mark. But like, hopefully, you know, when people post stuff like that nowadays, I think they are getting called out on it and mm -hmm. not in like a mean way, but getting called in kindly of like, hey, have you ever thought how this might affect somebody in a marginalized body seeing mm -hmm. this? And, um, 
yeah, it, and I just love everything you said. I, I put a post up about thin privilege the other day and I love every, every single time people are like, did you make this term up? I'm like, holy shit, we have a lot of work to do. Right. <laughs> It never, never fails. It's like, <laughs> wow. Or like someone like, that's not a real thing. I'm like, okay, maybe you should not follow then. <laughs> we... <laughs> oh, but yes, thank you for just, I love everything you said. I, I learned a lot from just listening to you there. And I'm just so thankful that you're in this space. And thanks for calling out too, how you said you're like, you know, we need to, for, for people in fat bodies or larger bodies, like move them forward mm -hmm. and how, you said, you know, people are looking at your account. You're like, maybe you can follow some of these people. And I think that's what everyone in this field is doing really well or starting to do is like push forward the people that need to be called upon and who haven't right. had the spotlight. So awesome. 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 So as we wrap up this episode, is there anything we talked about a lot of different things today, but is there anything that you are like, okay, if listeners can remember one thing from today's conversation, they're not going to remember anything else. What would you want them to remember? Ooh, that's hard. We really did talk about oh, a lot no. of things. You can, pick, <laughs> you can pick a couple of tidbits if you want, but <laughs> it's like one little synopsis of what you want someone to walk away remembering. Um, the first thing is that your appearance is not your value. If you could remember one thing every single day when you're feeling bad about your body, just remember that. And then the second thing um, I'll pull from the, uh, the talk about marginalized bodies. Uh, so understanding that personal body image work is separate from activism work for marginalized bodies. And, you know, just have that in mind before you're offended by posts about thin privilege and about, um, you know, the criticisms of the body positivity movement, because you know, it really isn't a personal attack. It's just a fact. Like this is something that is happening and it's something that we need to address. So keep all that in mind <laughs> um, and, you know, continue to do your personal body image work. And it really is important and no one is going to ever take that away from you. I love that. I love that. Body image issues do not discriminate. They are everywhere. And yep. so I love, I love how you said that. It's just focus on your personal body image work. I know that activism can come, but that is separate from mm -hmm. that personal. So for people listening, I think I already said it at the beginning of the episode, but where is the best place for them to find you if they want to learn all about you? Uh, definitely Instagram. Um, I am pretty much always on there um, as my main form of uh, getting content out. So Tiffany Ema. And then my website is tiffanyema.com and I'll be launching some courses pretty soon. So definitely keep an eye out for those because it's been on my to-do list for two years and it's time to check it off. <laughs> I love it. Well, you'll have to let us know when those are live and we will absolutely share those links for everyone to enjoy. Guys, thank you so much for listening to another episode of What the Actual Fork Pod. We know there are a lot of pods out there, and we are so grateful that you are here listening with us. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe, like, share with all your friends and faves, and follow along with us on social at what the actual fork pod. We promise to continue to bring you the hottest topics, greatest guests, and the most fun you can possibly have while fighting diet culture bullshit. We love you. We appreciate you. And we will see you next week for a lot more fun.